Okay? Um, when the, in the West, when Rome fell, they still had an emperor there, but he had no power. From 410 on, uh, for, until 476, there technically was a Western Roman emperor, but they were just puppets in the hands of the, of the ruling barbarians, whoever was the most powerful at that time. So, the church started gaining in importance. You will remember when we talked about the, the first sack of Rome, that Leo, Pope Leo, is the one who went out and negotiated, and he first negotiated with Attila the Hun, and got Attila to agree not to sack the city at all. Then he later went out and negotiated with Alaric of the Goths and got Alaric to limit the sacking. He would not burn the city. He didn't kill that many people. He took most of the stuff, but uh, it was much more, much less desperate. At that point, the Pope started under Leo in the, the mid-400s, early mid-400s, started to be a much more significant figure in terms of political. But it was this man, Gregory the Great, that really made the difference. Because what happened is, as all of these barbarian kings came along, as these barbarian um, nations, the nation of the Visigoths and Ostrogoths and everything else, I'm going to show you a map again in a minute when we talk about Charlemagne. Each of those kings, whichever one happened to be most powerful, was the one calling the shots. But there was no, no continuity. There was no empire. And so the religious structure of the Catholic Church began to take on more importance. Now, um, Gregory was the first pope, as I said, from a monastic background. He was very spiritually oriented. And you will remember the monastic orders, the growth of the monastic movement, started in the 300s, sort of as, there had been monks before this, but in a major way, as a reaction against the imperial involvement in the church. Once Constantine came along, the emperor was involved in the church, and they felt like that was poisoning things. Well, Gregory comes out of the monastic movements. He comes out of a sense of calling for purity in the church and for spiritual uh, focus and dedication, not political involvement. That was not where he was coming from. In fact, he did not want to be pope. Um, he wanted to go back to being a, a very simple monk. Now, when he, he, he Gregory came from a wealthy Roman family. His family had lived in different places when they came back to Rome. He had decided to join the church and to become a monk. But the Pope at that time, uh, when he was just a monk, a young monk, needed someone that he thought was intelligent enough that he could send to Constantinople to be the Pope, the Pope in Rome's emissary to the capital city of Constantinople. So he sent Gregory. So Gregory spent time in Constantinople, in the imperial court. And he argued with their theologians and actually developed quite a reputation as a theologian there. Finally came back to Rome, and when he came back to Rome, he decided, I'm going to be just a monk. But by this time, he had already proven that not only was he quite a theologian, but he also was quite an administrator. You know, he was good at running the mission to Constantinople from Rome. Well, the Pope suddenly dies in Rome, and by acclamation, they announce, Gregory, you're the new Pope. And he goes... I don't want to be Pope. I want to be a monk. And they said, nope, need a Pope. You're the Pope. So he takes over, but he dressed like a monk. He maintained a monastic cell that he could retreat to for a time of prayer. Um, he's a very different kind of guy than any of the Popes that had come before him. He also, um, I said this already, John Calvin had claimed him as the last good Pope of all the ones that came along after him. He's the patron saint of musician, of singers, of students, and of teachers. Um, and I'll explain why the, the musical side of that in a minute. Um, he's called the father of Christian worship because of his revisions to the Mass and his contributions to church music. You have heard of Gregorian chants, right? Now, traditionally, he was the one who created Gregorian chants. We do know that he went back into some of the, the, the typical masses of that day and, and revised them, added some elements, took some elements out, reordered them in order to make it more an act of worship. Uh, modern scholars question whether he actually was the one who created Gregorian chants. There also was a tradition that he was the one, in order to improve worship, he sent out into the whole empire, or the Western Empire at least, and gathered up all of the music they were using in churches and collated it. It's sort of like the first hymnal. Now again, that's a tradition. We don't have facts for that. But the idea is, he, we know he was very focused and oriented toward making church a worship experience. 
So he's called the father of Christian worship. Then uh, we also know that he's the most prolific writer of any pope up to that time. We, we know he wrote over 850 letters during his time as pope, sermons, commentaries, and he wrote uh, a thing called the rule of the pastor or for the pastor. Um, you remember rules in monastic orders. There's the Benedictine rule. There, there's the various other rules, which means a way of life. It's a handbook, a manual for how to do it. So a rule for pastors. And in the process, he really defined, for a modernist point, the Episcopal office, meaning the office of bishops. He defined you know, what it was to be a pastor, what it was to be a bishop, you know, how these things fit together, what responsibilities they had, etc. So he was very significant in terms of his writing. In fact, in the East, he sometimes is still referred to as Gregorius Dialogus. Because one of, his, one of the things he wrote that was very significant were the dialogues, which was a collection of stories about the church and miracles and all kinds of other things. So his writing was very significant. Um, he had a great passion for mission. As, as a former monk, he really believed in calling people to a spiritual life, and particularly calling people. Remember, he's, he's living in a time when, when most of Western Europe no longer has a strong church influence. There are a lot of pagans out there. There are a lot of non-Christians. Now, partly because of the influence of Gregory, partly because of some people who came before him and after him, but Gregory was a main player here, in the late 400s and the 500s, and again, you look at his date, 540 to 604, so he was, you know, um, the late 400s, 500s, and early 600s, during that period of time, almost all of the pagan barbarian groups became Christian. They were evangelized. Well, some of those groups very directly got evangelized and became Christians as a result of Gregory's uh, work. He sent missionaries. You know, he sent um, a man named uh, Augusta, not the same Augustine we know of in Hippo, to Britain and evangelized the British. So then the, uh, he had a real passion. There's a story that's told about him going to the slave market in Rome and seeing a bunch of uh, uh, boys who were English, and they were much fairer skinned. And he, he's asking about them. And they, he says, who are these boys? And they, they, he's told uh, they're Angles. You know, Anglo-Saxon. Angles was one of the groups uh, in, in Britain. These boys had been captive, captured as slave, and brought into slavery. And he said, well, they certainly look like angels, you know, um, and he kept asking questions. And they, he said, what province are they from? And they said, uh, De Ira. Well, Ira means anger, Dei means God. And he said, certainly they would not experience the anger of God. And he kept asking questions, and whatever they answered, he would reply in a spiritual way. But it was, it was his way of expressing concern that these boys were, you know, being sold into slavery, they were from a pagan country and they needed the light. And because of that, that, that story, which again, we don't have, uh, there wasn't somebody there recording it or anything, but we have that story coming down through the historians, um, he had a passion for sending missionaries to the pagan parts of the world, most notably Britain. And his missionaries to Britain evangelized the whole of the British Isles, pretty much. Okay? And uh, those that, for instance, St. Patrick, who was a Christian Briton who got uh, who got similarly kidnapped and taken to slavery in Ireland? It was not Christian at that time because Patrick came from a Christian background. When he escaped and went back and then grew up a little bit, he went back to Ireland and evangelized Ireland. Well, Patrick would not have had the foundation being a Christian to evangelize Ireland if Britain hadn't been evangelized because of the efforts of Gregory the Great. Okay, so very significant in that regard. Um, he was widely known, widely, widely known for his charitable efforts. In fact, part of what happened here is, again, the barbarians are ruling things. They periodically would sack Rome. Um, there wasn't a lot of help out there. The army was kind of helpless. And so the people are suffering, and they're hungry. And they really are in need of humanitarian aid. Well, appeal after appeal had gone to the technically who was still the emperor, but, and that is the emperor in Constantinople. You know, but he was a continent away. You know, you're talking about from Rome to Istanbul away. And he was busy with stuff in the east, and so they never did respond. And so Constant, or Constant, uh, Gregory, as the religious leader, he said, fine, if we're not going to get help from, from the, the emperor in Constantinople, then we'll do it ourselves. He launched charitable efforts that were widespread and comprehensive. He made it a responsibility 
of all of the members of the clergy, both monks and priests, to care for the physical needs of the people in their area. In fact, he would censure, he would discipline anybody who didn't. He didn't make it, this was not optional. He personally would be involved in this. Uh, for instance, he, because he was a monk and he didn't like all of, he, he had sent away all of the attendants that the Pope had had before, um, all this retinue of people that are supposed to be taking care of him, and he had only monks um, and, and earth, other clergy who were practic who were working in the Vatican with him. And then um, one of the things he did is he had br he brought the table from his own home, you know, the home of his parents, and it seated um, like could seat twelve or thirteen people. So whenever he ate at table, he would have twelve um, indigent people eat with him. You know, he always made sure the table was completely filled with other people besides himself. He wouldn't eat by himself. He would have poor people come and eat with him. Um, there was one family who came from nobility and had been wealthy, but had fallen on hard times and, and were really poor now. Um, because they were noble and they were so proud, it said that they would not take charity. And so, because he too came from nobility, I mean, his parents had been wealthy noble, Roman nobles, Gregory would prepare food for them with his own hands and take it to their home and say, this isn't charity, this is one noble just offering a gift to other nobles. So you don't have to feel like it's charity. You get the feeling for, for the kind of commitment, the spiritual commitment that, you know. Now, he wasn't perfect. He had a temper, they say. If you, if you violated what he thought were spiritual truths, he, he's quick to let you know about it. Okay? I mean, he had been, um, when he became a monk, because of his administrative gifts, he, he launched a number of monasteries. And then one of them, he, he, and he was abbot over those, and served in one of them. Uh, because he was abbot, he was pretty strict on the monks that served under him. This is before he became pope. Now, this is very significant for several reasons. One, um, just because he represented a different kind of image for popes. But because of his good deeds and his leadership, and the absence of other political leaders, the last of the Western Roman emperors, who was called Romulus Augustulus, had been discarded by uh, Adoacer, who was, a, who was a pagan general, in 476. So, right, you know, before the time that um, that Gregory comes along, there was no real leadership. Constantinople was too busy to worry about them. From this point on, people started looking to after even after Gregory to the popes to provide them not only religious guidance and leadership, but political as well, or civil, you might say. That it was the Pope that was responsible for uh, taking care of the city and taking care of the people and making sure things are done in order and, and managing the courts and all of that kind of stuff. And the Pope started being responsible for that. Now, that's very important because this issue of who's really in charge, is it the Pope or is it the Emperor, because there are other Emperors who come along later, who's in charge? In fact, some of these pagan kings who became Christians later, there were controversies and conflicts between various popes and these leaders. The people who had known Gregory and some of the popes after him, even before him, like Leo in the, in the early 400s, um, they said, well, the pope is in charge. He's the representative of God. He manages all of the eternal spiritual things, and certainly the physical world is less than that. But you had emperors, and then later on you had some of these kings who would say, at least in their territory, well, yeah, but you guys don't do anything unless I let you. You know, I have the ability, I have the, the, the military, I have the power to either let you or not let you do things. And so this conflict between, is it the pope, the representative of God on earth, they said, who is the main leader, the one who has the most authority, or is it the king, or the emperor, in, that, in some cases? Barbara. Can you refresh my memory? Who was emperor at this time? There was no emperor in the west. In the east, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, it was one of the descendants of Constantine, you know, by this time, because this this would have been a hundred, you know, almost two hundred years after Constantine came on. So there power. wasn't one one in Rome. Did, did no, and the last Western Roman emperor was Augustulus uh, uh, Romulus Augustulus. And he had been deposed, and the position had just been gotten rid of by Odeoser, who was a barbarian king, in 476. So that was like 50 years before we're talking about Gregory here. So there was no emperor anymore. 
Well, that, that's why his, his position was so solidified, because there was no government yeah. authority there, so they began to look at him. But there were, the, the popes that came before Gregory were not particularly strong, and so the people felt like there is no leader. We don't have a strong pope to lead us, we don't have an emperor, you know, the, we're completely at the whims of these barbarians, whoever, whoever happens to be in charge right now. Now, this would become important later, because we went, the, the church went through a long history of, of what's called the investiture controversies. Investiture is the process of appointing somebody to be a bishop, okay, appointing somebody to have a position of authority in the church. Well, tip, historically, the pope had done that, or you know, the, in the patriarch in the east, whatever. But when the popes were weak, and the kings were powerful, or they just didn't like the popes, and they were up in what, say, what we know today as France, the kingdom of the Franks, or Germany, or Spain, the kings would appoint whoever they wanted to be bishops. Well, the pope didn't like that, but most of the time the pope didn't have any power to do anything about it. And what the pope would do in those cases, if they strongly disagreed, they had two weapons. One was excommunication. They could tell the king, or whoever it was, that it violated this. Um, including the bishops that took the positions, you're excommunicated. You can't take communion and you're damned to hell. The second thing they could do, um, it was what was called uh, an interdiction, which meant not only, since you're king over this land, not only do you not get communion and you're excommunicated, but we will not allow communion to be served in your whole, whole, the whole area you control. Which meant all of the people there who felt like they needed to take communion in order to receive grace, in order to be okay with God, they would get mad at the king because the king was the one that was keeping them from being able to receive grace. And we have cases where they would rise up in rebellion because the king had, had offended the pope. Interdiction sometimes could even take the form of the pope saying, um, Christians elsewhere cannot trade with any of the people in this domain, in any of this kingdom. You can't, and so all of a sudden they're cut off and their economy is hurt. So that's one of the aspects of interdiction that they could apply as well. Those were the Pope's weapons. Um, the King's weapons, obviously, usually was military. And there were times when the Pope had to call on somebody who did have an army. Later on, the Popes developed their own armies. But to call on somebody who had an army to defend them from some other pagan group. Because once you got to the place where some of the pagan tribes were Christian and some of them were still pagan, I should say, some of the barbarian tribes were Christian, and some were still pagan. For instance, the Lombards was a barbarian group who settled in, uh, they came from up sort of Germany area, east of East Germany, what we would think of, and it came down and settled in northern uh, Italy, and they were constant, constantly threatening Rome, constantly threatening the papal estates, as they were called. And so they would call on the Franks or some other group of barbarians, although they weren't barbarians by that time, that's how they started, who were Christian to come and help. And so there was this back, this seesaw thing going on all the time. But the investiture controversy had to do with who has the authority to put people into positions in the church. Now, why did that matter? Well, because as the church, you know, after Constantine, the church was legal and everything else, people who wanted to be in God's good graces, who wanted to do something to, to get benefit, uh, who had wealth, they would give gifts to the church, and those gifts frequently were land. So that throughout Europe, well, throughout the, the whole Christian world, but we're talking about Europe here because we're talking about the influence of the Western uh, world of the Pope. Throughout Europe, there were large tracts of land that produced income that belonged to the church. Well, the person responsible for that, and the person who benefited most directly from it, was the bishop over that area. Whoever was the bishop was the authority over that land and over whatever it produced. And so you ended up, um, the investiture issue sort of circled around the sin, it was later decided it was a sin, of simony. You remember the New Testament, Simon the Magician, who went to the apostles when he saw that they could do miracles? And he said, how much can I pay you to let me be able to do that? The offer of paying for religious authority became known as simony because of Simon the Magician. And simony was to pay to get a religious position. So you had these men who looked around in various parts of Europe and they'd say, man, 
the bishop for this area controls like 50,000 acres of producing land and there's a palace and there's gold silverware and there's robes with gems on them and that, that's pretty cool and they would go to the local king whoever, whoever controlled this and say how much will you charge to make me the bishop and so the king would say okay you owe me this much up front and then I get 20% of whatever you produce because the Pope's in Rome you know he's not in, in northern Germany or northern Spain or whatever and so they were selling simony they were selling these positions so that they could make money off of them both the person who took the position and so the Pope would say if you uh, if you're a king and you do that then I'm gonna excommunicate you and put an, an, an interdiction on you and your land if you're a bishop who has taken your position because you paid for it I will excommunicate you now those were the weapons the Pope had and so there's always this back and forth, back and forth. And this lasted for hundreds of years. If you had a really strong pope, then he would quell this kind of stuff. But if you had a weak pope and a really strong king somewhere, then the problem would come up again. And there were all kinds of back and forths. How do you, how do you spell Simon? S-I-M-O-N-Y, like the name Simon with a Y on the end. Simon. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes, Joanne. Am I correct that Rome is kind of its own state, country, whatever? And how did that come about? Well, Rome isn't. The Vatican is. The Vatican, yes. Yeah. Well, um, it. How did it come about? The, there was a period of time, um, we're getting ready to talk about Charlemagne, Charles the Great. Charlemagne's father, Pepin the Short, okay, there was, there was a, a later. Um, I told you, you know, there were kings who were blah blah the stupid, and you know, uh, Voldemort the fat or whatever. They, I'm sure they didn't prove these names, but anyway, Pepin the Short, Charlemagne's father, had um, I'm getting ahead of here a little bit. He had been a very powerful man. In fact, he was so powerful, and the king was so weak, and Childeric the Third was so weak, he had no power, he had no authority, and Pepin, uh, Pepin's father, Charles Martel, and then Pepin the Short after him were the high mayors um, in, up in the sort of uh, the low countries kind of thing in Germany, the Frankish kingdom as well. And the high mayor had all the power. Well, finally, after two generations of the high mayor having all the power and the king sort of sitting around drooling, you get this image of him being completely useless, Pepin the Short goes to the Pope, Pope Zachary at that point, and said, does it make any sense that the king is useless and doesn't do anything? And the high mayor has all the authority, but wouldn't it make a whole lot more sense for the person who has all the authority to be named king? And Pope Zachary said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Partly because he wanted Pepin's support. Because he was the king of the Franks, which was one of the most powerful kingdoms. Um, so he declared, he ordered Pepin to take over his king. And he ordered Childeric III to go to a monastery and abdicate his throne. And he did it. Um, so Childeric's out of the way, they have an election among the Franks, and they affirm what the Pope has already said has happened, and they make Pepin the king. Well, in return for that, Pepin grants large tracts of land in um, the area surrounding Rome, and that became the Papal, or Papal States. The Papal States um, were like their own little country. They were run by, owned by the Pope, technically, or by the Church, but the Pope ran it. Um, and all that produce came to them. Later on, with the independence of Italy, you know, as a nation and various other things, all of that got shrunk down. And the only thing that existed after that from the whole papal, you know, the, the papal estates, was the actual Vatican City. And that was its own country. It has, its, it has national recognition. It has representation on, you know, the international uh, 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 gatherings. It has its own flag. Um, so it is its own nation, but that was sort of a condensation from what at one time were papal estates when, when that whole part of the world was broken up into all sorts of different pieces. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions about that? There may be a better answer for the specifics on how Vatican City is independent, and I'll see if I can find that for you. Okay. Well, just yeah. one brief comment. Uh, you, you look at this man, Gregory. Pope Gregory, and, and it, it's striking to me, he becomes a Pope at 50 years old, 
when he's been a monk, you know, living in, in solitude and, and all of this, and he's a, he's a pope for what, what, 16 years yep. or something like that? And he accomplishes all of this. Yeah, and, and, but he starts when he's 50, mm -hmm. and people were dying before then. Yep. You know, it was probably a rare thing for anybody to last till 50. <laughs> But uh, one of the things that had happened right before he got elected was that there was a massive outbreak of plague. Yeah. In fact, they called it the Justinian plague because Justinian had been the, the emperor yeah. in Constantinople who had refused to help them with anything. So um, one of the ones. There's more than one in that case. So yeah, he was, a, he was an amazing guy. And again, we need to understand that he sort of set the high mark for what the pope could be. Um, and had influence for worship, for missiology, for um, uh, charitable. You know, he's the one that really said the church more, before, more than anybody before him. Granted, the New Testament church cared for those who were in need, but in terms of the, you know, the, the Catholic Church, he's the one who said this isn't an option. We have to do this. Okay, so that the charitable aspect was he really drove that, and then he established a standard of, in terms of authority, in the absence of political authority, that ended up, uh, you know, you can say in one way it was the cause of part of the problem because some people always then after that looked to the Pope to be the one in charge, and then some people looked to the civil authorities, you know, the political leaders, and so there were conflicts. But it's very clear under Gregory he was in charge, okay? All right, um, I want to talk now about Charlemagne. But this, this is the image that I was talking about uh, earlier. Some, after the fall of Rome, so this is like the mid-400s, mid to late 400s, all of this used to be the Roman Empire, okay, all of it. You will notice there's a line right here, and this says the Byzantine Empire. That, this is the Western Roman Empire. The Byzantines, we call it Byzant, what's that? Eastern. Uh, Eastern, I said Western? Okay, yeah. Eastern Roman Empire. Um, the, we call it Byzantine in order to differentiate it from Rome, but in fact they thought of themselves as Rome, Romans. They, they were the Eastern Roman Empire, and they called themselves Romans right up until the fall in the 1400s of Constantinople. This is Constantinople right here. And so this, this part was still the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, what we call the Byzantine Empire. But most people, if you ask them, I've said this before, when Rome... When the Roman Empire ended, they'll say 400s. It actually ended in the 1400s because this was still the Roman Empire. But this and this line here is about where Diocletian had split the Eastern and Western, right? Everything on the Western end now, instead of being the Western Roman Empire, as it had been, it is the kingdom of the Ostrogoths and the kingdom of the Burgundians and the kingdom of the Franks and the kingdom of the Visigoths and uh, the Alemanni, and the Lombards, and the Gepids, etc., etc. <coughs> All of these independent, individual, barbarian kingdoms. And all of those different groups were all of uh, different, you know, most of them had come from Asia. They were um, Huns, for instance, Hungary. The Huns had come from the Russian steppes, from the steppes of Asia, and gone back again. Well, when the next time, one of the next invasions, was from closer in Eastern Europe, the people thought they looked and acted like the Huns, so they called them the Hungars, you know, similarly, and that's where, and they finally settled in Hungary, right? So all of this is, there's a link between the Tell of the Hun, at least in perception, and the Hungarians, not literally, but in terms of name. Um, and you get the Slavs and the Avars and the Slavic peoples up here, etc. So this is what it looked like in the 400s. Now remember, the late 400s and 500s and into the early 600s, almost all of these groups became Christian. Particularly what would happen is their king would decide. Now, it wasn't always as clean as that because sometimes um, there was still the Arian heresy. Some of them were converted by Arian uh, believers and so they had an, not an Orthodox Nicene uh, belief, but an Arian belief some of them were, were monophysites, believing Jesus had one nature. Some of them were Nestorians, you know. So various heresies still existed, and some, some, some of these groups bought into some of that because they were converted by people who believed that, but still they were Christian. Now, this is what it looked like in the late 400s, 500s, etc. And it still pretty much changed, was like that, except more of them were becoming Christians, 
Some of the lines were changing, etc. Now, we have another character coming along here named Charlemagne. Charlemagne, um, this photograph's been touched up. I always have to make jokes about that. Photoshop. Um, Photoshop. The, um, you'll notice he is holding the orb, which is a sign of his rule and, his, and uh, also his sword. Uh, there are a lot of different images you can get. We do have descriptions of what he looked like, just like we have descriptions of what um, Gregory the Great looked like. Uh, Gregory the Great was a smooth man, we're told. <laughs> Short. Short. Yeah. No, that's Charlemagne. No. No, no, I meant Gregory. Oh. No, it was uh, it was Charlemagne's father was Pepin the Short. Oh. Short. Yes. Okay. Um, so Charlemagne, he lived from 742 to 814. Uh, so we're looking at uh, we're 300 years after the fall of Rome. And so there's been 300 years of all of Western Europe controlled by these different different warring tribes, most of whom have become Christian now. Not all, but most. He was named King of the Franks in 768. What happened is uh, Charles Martel was his grandfather, and Charles Martel was a great general who, uh, because his ancestor had, been, had become a Christian, Martel fought against the Moors and drove them out of France, back down into Spain. Um, Martel's father, what's that? The Hammer, right? Uh, Charles the Hammer, Martel. And so then you get Pepin the Short, Charles Martel's son. Pepin the Short is the one who went to the Pope and said, why do we have this useless king, Childric III? Why don't you make the person who really has the power the king? And the Pope said it, and then the Franks agreed with it. Uh, and then Pepin the Short had two sons. There was Charles and a second son. And Pepin split the kingdom between the two of them. And very shortly after that, the other son died under unknown circumstances. <laughs> We'd like to think Charlemagne didn't have him done away with, but whatever. So Charles takes over as all the king of the Franks in 768. He then starts a number of military campaigns to try to expand that kingdom. Now, I've said before in this class, and I realized after I said it, like that night, that it wasn't completely accurate. Uh, somebody had asked me about whether or not Christian uh, ever forced people into the Christian faith by force of arms. And I said, no. I was thinking about the early growth of the church when it was done entirely by witness, by missionary. But when you get into this time period, Charlemagne did force the Slavs and the Avars and some other people that he conquered into Christianity. Okay. Uh, now, he did it partly... Uh, as a stabilizing influence. I mean, he did, a, he did it almost as much for political reasons as he did for religious reasons. Let's just be honest about that. Although he was a very committed believer himself, and he did think that was the right thing, it is true that he fought a lot of battles, and when he conquered them, he said, okay, king, you now have to become a Christian and be baptized, and then tell everybody else to as well. So there are times in which Christianity did do that. But as a rule, the majority growth of Christianity, where it encircled the whole of the Mediterranean Sea, that all happened initially by witness, not by force of arms. Unlike the growth of Islam, which started out of Arabia, conquered the Middle East, conquered North Africa, all the way up through Syria and into, uh, I'm going to show you a map in a minute. That was all done militarily. Now, the Muslims tended to be fairly generous uh, overlords once they did conquer, but the process of conquering was a very bloody one. That typically was not true in Christian cases. But it, was, it is true that Charlemagne did use force of arms sometimes uh, to convert people. Now, and then we're going to talk about how in the year 800 he became the Holy Roman Emperor. And what does that mean? Okay, I'll get to that. Charlemagne is called the father of Europe by many people because he expanded the control or the kingdom of the Franks, which is where he started, um, into much of what we now know as Western Europe. From being disparate barbarian tribes with different kings to being a fairly uh, unified group again, the first time since the Roman Empire fell, 300 and some years earlier, that there was a sense of general unity, not complete, but general. Um, and so he's recognized as the one who sort of brought an identity as Europe. See, but when Rome was in charge, it was the Roman Empire, and it was more than just Europe. Western Europe, what we think of as, as uh, Western Europe, it was Charlemagne that brought them together and gave it some sense of identity. That even though it kind of it sort of came and went after that, it always sort of maintained that idea that there is a Europe and it's an entity. Um, 
His father, Pepin the Short, had been a high mayor. I mentioned this already. He asked Pope Zachary, and then when the Pope ordered, Pep ordered Pepin to take over as king, the Franks voted to make him king, and then that title passed on to Charlemagne and to his other, his other brother, Carolus, uh, to his brother Carolus, and then Carolus died. And Charlemagne, Charles, uh, was ruler of everything. He was a committed Christian, and he supported the papacy as his father, Pepin the Short, had before him. When the popes needed an army, a Christian army, to come and help them against the Lombards or whatever, they would call on the Franks, who were one of their favorites, because they were really committed to supporting the church, and particularly the pope. Notice that it was Pepin the Short, when he wanted some authority to take over as king, he went to the pope and asked him for a ruling. Uh, and then Pepin gave lands, the papal estates, to... So there was a close relationship between these Christian Franks and the, and by the way, that of course is where we get the name France, is from the kingdom of the Franks. Um, this actually involved more than just that. The royal, the royal lines of both France and Germany later would trace their lines back to Charlemagne. So both France and Germany found their, their historic traditions there, but the name the, of the kingdom of the Franks was given to the nation of France. Um, in 800, uh, Pope Leo was having a really hard time with the people in Rome. They were, they were out to get him. In fact, they, uh, they tried to have Leo's tongue torn out and have him blinded. He was Pope. So he was not getting along very well with people in Rome. So he ran for it. And once he got away, he contacted Charlemagne and said, Can you help me? So Charlemagne comes down, picks up the Pope on the way. They go into Rome, and he's got an army at his back, and he tells the people of Rome, nah, 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 you don't treat the Pope that way. And they all go, okay, <laughs> you say so, because by this time, by 800, he had already conquered most of the stuff he conquered, and had the most powerful army in that part of the world. And so they did what Charlemagne said. Well, as soon as that happens, Christmas Day comes along, and they're having a mass in uh, St. Peter's Basilica, and or what was St. Peter's Basilica then? They, they it wasn't nearly the edifice it is now. And uh, Charlemagne is kneeling there, praying. Now, there's a, there are different ideas about what happens here. Some people believe, some scholars believe, Charlemagne knew exactly what was about to happen. Some people say he was completely surprised because Pope Leo in gratitude for the fact that he's been saved by Charlemagne and his place has been affirmed and people aren't going to mess with him anymore, King Leo comes over and takes a throne, a crown and puts it on the kneeling Charlemagne's head and, and proclaims him the emperor of all the Roman peoples. It's kind of hard to believe that Charlemagne didn't know that was coming. <laughs> but whether he did or not, that was the point at which he became the Holy Roman Emperor. In effect, they were declaring that the Western Roman Empire was reestablished with Charlemagne as the, as the guy in charge. Now, uh, this idea of the Holy Roman Empire would continue, um, well, actually from, from Charlemagne, his son, Louis the Pious, Pious, but he wasn't a very good ruler. And so very shortly after Charlemagne's death, the, his kingdom sort of fell apart. Not literally, but it simply didn't have the continuity, didn't have the leadership. And so the idea of a Holy Roman Empire, as it was called, in Western Europe, it died out uh, for, how long was it? Uh, till the 960s. So it was like 150 years or so. And at that point, a German named Otto I was crowned as the, the new Holy Roman Emperor. So there's a period of almost about 150 years or so in between Charlemagne and the next Holy Roman Emperor when there wasn't, there wasn't a Roman Empire, Holy Roman Empire or a Holy Roman Emperor. But when Otto I was crowned in the 900s, that continued for um, over, a, well, the last Holy Roman Emperor was Francis II, um, so it lasted like 800 years that there was a, in Western Europe, they called it, the Holy Roman Empire. Even though there were separate countries that developed, Germany, France, Italy, etc., um, there was a sense in which all of them were part of this 
this conglomerate that they called the Holy Roman Empire, and they had an emperor who had authority. Okay? Um, so this was a big deal in terms of a movement forward in civilization. Now, in addition to becoming this emperor, Charlemagne instituted widespread administrative reforms. Again, he's controlling most of Western Europe by now, and so he established standardized weights and measures standardized customs practices so that there would be trade both within the, the new Roman Empire, the, the Holy Roman Empire, and from people outside. So he was a very strong administrator. He ran things really well in addition to being a great general. Not only that, but he encouraged developments in education, in the arts, in culture, and literacy. He created libraries. Now remember, Western Europe has been in the Dark Ages. There weren't libraries. In fact, most cities had been abandoned because if you lived in the city, you were a prime target for some marauding band of Huns or Visigoths or Lombards or somebody else. Um, literacy almost went away in Western Europe during this time. People forgot how to read because they had other concerns like staying alive and you know being on the run from the Goths and things like that. So um, literacy died out. I talked before about the fact that uh, there was a huge influence from the, from the Irish monasteries who did maintain libraries and maintain learning and maintain reading because the barbarian hordes never made it to Ireland. The Irish were scary enough bunch of barbarian hordes before they came, became Christian anyway. So people left them alone. Besides, it was a long way to go over water to get to Ireland, the other side of Britain. So the Irish brought some of this back. But in the 800s, early 800s, Charlemagne instituted what's called the Carolingian Renaissance. Carolingian, um, in Latin, his name was Carolus. Okay, so the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, the group before him were the Merovingians, if you ever see that name. That was Childric III was the last of the Merovingians, and they stuck him in a monastery. But this is the Carolingian, Carolingian um, dynasty and the Renaissance. So he was striking on all cylinders. You know, he, he established peace, great administrator, militarily, he couldn't be beat. And one of the reasons why, by the way, he was so successful in military is because his grandfather, Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, who was so successful at fighting the Moors and driving them back, um, invented the modern use of cavalry. He invented this sort of shock troop approach with cavalry. They had horses before that, but they usually weren't coordinated. They were just sort of, um, it's suggested, although some scholars aren't sure about this, that Charles Martel invented the stirrup. Imagine trying to go into battle on a horse without stirrups. You know, it'd be kind of hard to hold a lance and lance somebody with, you know, if you don't have any stirrups. Well, sometime around there, whether Martel actually did it or took advantage of or whatever, they invented stirrups. And so it became much more practical to assault on a horse. So Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, and then Charlemagne benefited from these new innovations. And that's why they were so successful militarily. Those of you who are missed military history buffs might find that interesting. Uh, sometimes it's the little things, like inventing a stirrup, can make a huge difference. All right? um, this is what the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne. Now, it had been, the kingdom of the Franks had originally been, you were, well, let me, let me go back to that real quick so you can just sort of see what it looked like. Um, this is what it looked like before. The kingdom of the Franks were, um, this would be France and northern Germany, probably, okay? Now, under Charlemagne, He spread all the way down into all of, uh, pretty much all of Spain. Um, we've got Provence, all of France, all of Germany, you know, what used to be called Schwabia, uh, Bavaria. Now, his, his line is this red dotted line. The different colors here indicate at what time these things were taken over, because Charles Martel expanded some, Pepin the Short expanded some, and then Charlemagne really did it. So he controls almost all of Italy. Um, all the way over you know, the, into the Balkans. These are the Croats and Serbs, what we know as Croatia and Serbia. Um, so most all of Western Europe over into Eastern Europe, all was part of Charlemagne's empire, the Holy Roman Empire. Okay? And he tied it all together and did a really good job. <laughs> Any questions about that? Remember, he was a Christian. And so the church, all of a sudden, had 
once again the support of the government, as they had under, you know, uh, under um, Constantine. And they weren't going to be threatened by these barbarian hordes anymore because you know, the biggest barbarian in the, at the party was Charlemagne. <laughs> and he was now a Christian. So it was a very different kind of world once Charlemagne came along. Now again, that staggered a little bit, but they always still maintain a sense of it being the uh, Western Europe and the, the Christian presence was not driven back again in any significant way after that. Yes? It's interesting, this Holy Roman Empire, which ebbed and waned, I guess, and finally came to an end, is now repeated centuries later with the European Union. Perhaps so, it's, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. Well, um, and again, the, the Holy Roman Empire was, for most of its history later on, like it finally died out under Francis II, because they, were, they finally got to the point of saying, and what is this really anyway? I mean, the power is in Germany, and it's in France, and it's in Italy, etc. It's not in this empire kind of thing, and you're just a figurehead, so why are we bothering anymore? We're putting you up in really nice houses and giving you really expensive clothes to wear, and maybe that isn't worth it to us anymore. Um, but then you get, sort of as an offshoot of that, you get the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which, led, which didn't end until the First World War, which was you know, some of the same sections. We call it Austro-Hungarian, but it controlled large areas. Um, and that was sort of a descendant, fairly immediate descendant, of the idea of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. So you do get some of the residue of that that carries all the way over to the 20th century. Okay, let's take a break for a few minutes. I've got five after. Let's come back at a quarter after. I want to spend a few minutes talking about cathedrals, of all things, um, because the development of cathedrals was, is a, I think a... What's that? Is the camera on? Yeah, it's yes. just going right. Um, the development of cathedrals really does sort of track with the development of the church in some very interesting ways, even theological ways. Um, of course, the early Christian, that is AD 33, you know, about the time of Jesus' death, thereabouts, through the 5th century is considered the early Christian period. Um, Christian worship started out in the synagogues. They would worship in the synagogues. We read in Acts that um, Peter and John, for instance, were going up to the synagogue for the hour of prayer in the afternoon. Um, and so they continued. In fact, some Christians continued to participate in synagogue worship as well as Christian gatherings for a very long time, up to the point where Origen, one of the early church fathers, had to tell Christians, you, pro you probably should stop doing that because it's getting confusing. Um, there were then, after synagogue worship, Christians had secret house churches. Sometimes they met in the catacombs. And as we say, um, we really romanticize this catacomb thing. Um, but one of the reasons they did that is because when it was illegal to be a church, it was legal to be a funerary society. And so they would sometimes meet in the catacombs because they had control over and, and rights to, you know, purchase rights to places of burial. And so they would gather there. Um, the oldest extant, meaning still ex in existence, house church we have uh, is sometime before AD 257, and it's in the Roman town of Dura Europas in Syria, where it is the building is still there. And we know that it was a Christian church, and it is from sometime before 257. We can, we can verify that. Now, after 2, 313, what happened in 313? Somebody? Uh, Constantine. Constantine? Constantine. Actually, yeah. Uh, 313 was the declaration of Milan, uh, which said it was legal to be a Christian now. Okay. The, and it was, Constantine was the one involved in that. So Constantine comes along, and Christians begin to build churches. In fact, Constantine sponsored churches. He paid for them. Um, and they built them in form of basilicas. A basilica was a Roman design that was intended for any sort of public meeting place. They sometimes would build temples on this model, but also public, you know, uh, any areas where they expected they were going to have gatherings of people. And the basilica was designed. This is sort of a cutaway view of it. There's a central area called a nave. And then, usually there were columns to help support the roof, and in between those columns would be a series of one, two, three, or possibly even more, um, of what's called aisles. That's so that if you had a lot of people gathered here for whatever the event was, there was still a way for people to move around without, you know, messing with the crowd. They would have a, a large area here, an, an apse area. There would usually be what's called an atrium, an entrance. 
This was a Roman design. The early churches were based on that. And in fact, you can still see elements of that in churches much later on. It changed slightly, but we still had naves and aisles and atriums and chancels and uh, apses and various things like that. We'll look at that a little bit. But this was the first design. The next thing that, was, that happened was we get Byzantine design. In the 6th century, that is the 500s, through the 15th uh, centuries, in the eastern part of the uh, Christendom, in the eastern world, they would they designed the um, these kind of basilicas. The idea was it was based upon a Greek cross, which is a square cross, um, and it would have a central dome and then four surrounding domes. Sometimes they would have half domes that came off of it, and all of this used basically the principle of the Roman arch. You know, the arch distributes the, the... The question when you build a big building is always how do you distribute the weight? That's why we have these silly columns right in the middle of our church sanctuary out here. Because you've got to have someone to support the roof. Well, the arch was a phenomenal improvement on that. The Greeks, one of the great limitations the Greeks had is they never developed an arch. That's why when you go up on the Acropolis and you visit the uh, Parthenon and the temples in, in Greece, there are all columns with flat things on top. There are no arches because the Greeks didn't invent the arch. The Romans did. That's why the Romans could build bridges, and the Greeks were not very successful at that. So this idea of a dome, a dome is just a three-dimensional arch. So you get domes and half domes, like this one here, supporting the weight of the church. Um, frequently, they, they would use massive stone piers, and then they would either use stone or sometimes brick and mortar, things like that. Now, the most extraordinary version of that, maybe ever, is in Constantinople. It is the Hagia Sophia, or the Hagia Sophia, some people call it. Um, this church, which, which uh, Hagia Sophia means the uh, divine wisdom. The full Greek name of this church was the Church of the Divine Wisdom of God. Uh, this is outside. Now you'll notice that there are minarets. This church was built in the 500s by the Emperor Justinian and his wife uh, Theodosia. And when they built it, it was the largest church in all of Christendom. Christendom is the word meaning for the Christian world. In fact, it remained the largest church for over a thousand years until a bigger one was built in, um, in Spain. Still today, it's like third or fourth largest ever built. Now, the reason why the minarets is because when Constantinople was conquered by the Turks, the Seljuk Turks, they turned this into a mosque. And so they built the minarets. Those were added later. Then in 1931, when Turkey was trying to gain acceptance into the, into the, the main part of the world, um, they decided that that was kind of an offense that the largest and one of the most significant Christian places of worship ever was now a Muslim place of worship. They closed it for four years, cleaned off, they covered all the Christian symbolism stuff inside. They hadn't destroyed it, they just plastered over it because you can't have images of people in Islamic art. You can only have calligraphy and mosaic designs, but you can't have peoples represented. And so they cleaned all of that off and they opened it as a museum. So since the 1930s, it has been a museum, which is available today. But the mosques were laid, added much later when it was a monastery, um, or when it, was a, when it was turned from a church into a mosque, rather, sorry. This, one of the most astonishing things people always commented on uh, down through history, and again, we have 1,500 years of people commenting on this church, was the uh, the dome, that it seemed to just sort of float up there, you know, this extraordinary dome. Well, I'm sure you look at that and you go, well, that's kind of cool, but what's the big deal? Well, to know what the big deal of the dome is, you have to look at it this way. These are people. That's the dome. You get the idea? The Statue of Liberty could stand upright in this thing, not minus her torch. If you took her torch off, the Statue of Liberty can stand in here. Can you even imagine what it would have been like in the 500s for somebody to walk into this building and look up? Who constructed it? Uh, you mean who built it? Uh, they're, they're, they have the names of the architects. I don't know the No, I mean, I mean under whose reign? Justinian. The Emperor Justinian, uh, who was uh, Justinian and Theodosia. Um, 
a couple of other pictures of it to give you again another idea. This is from the balcony. And, and I don't even know if you can tell, but that's a person right there. Yeah. Okay. So the idea of this being around in the 500s and 600s and 700s and 800s, when most people were still living in mud huts, I mean, Constantinople was a nice city, but most pe people come from around the world. The reason the Russians became Christians is this. The Russian king sent emissaries to Constantinople, and the only thing they could talk about when they first got back is this church. And they said, it's a miracle. you got to go with these guys. If they can do that, the Russian king became a Christian. He took the title Tsar, which meant Caesar, because remember, this was the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And they modeled themselves after that. In fact, later on, you know, there was Rome, and then Constantinople called themselves the second Rome. Later on, the Tsar declared that Moscow was the third Rome. And so, um, all my life I've wanted to go to this place. Um, and, and I didn't have enough time there, so now we're going to go back. Uh, but these lights, you know, hang here, and then again, you get some idea. These are friends of ours. These are the movies. <laughs> um, this is not the best way to represent these pictures either, but, uh, okay. But you get the idea. Ross? Yes. Just a question. Does the word cathedral, what, what, uh, um, Latin? Roman? I think I know, but I'm going to have to look it up. I think it may be related to the word chapel. But um, Capella, but I'm not sure about that. And Basilica, come, like, what was the difference between a basilica? Was it because of the Byzantine? No, the basilica is a design style. I mean, oh, basilica okay. is a Roman word, and it, it, I think it's, it's rooted in uh, gathering. Okay, the word is based on a word that means gathering. It was a place for people to meet. It was a Roman idea. Well, the um, when the Hagia Sophia was based upon, and some other churches based upon, the basilica model that the Romans had for a gathering place. Another interesting thing is this Christian church became the model for mosques after that. In, in Istanbul, you can go to Hagia Sophia, but you can also go to the Blue Mosque, to the Mosque of Suleiman, and others, and they're exactly the same design. You know, none of them are as big as this. Um, some of them are impressive in very different ways. The Blue Mosque is called the Blue Mosque because the inside of it is all blue. Uh, tile, you know, blue and white tile, and it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, the, the design work on this stuff is just amazing. You will notice, by the way, let me have to go back, that um, these medallions have Arabic sayings on them. They, those were left up from when it was a mosque, but they did clear off. Right there is an image of the Virgin Mary and child uh, over the apse. This was the main altar area. And so they were right over top of that. And then up in the corners, up here, you can't really see it in these images, there were giant cherubs who had all of that, all of the, all of the images had been plastered over and have been uncovered down there like in you can see. Um, Atatur, the guy who brought Turkey into the 20th century and civilized it, changed it, changed everything. He changed the way they dressed, he changed the alphabet, he changed everything. He's the one that said, this is not going to fly in the West for us to still have this as a mosque. Um, so, quite extraordinary. Do we know how long it took to build? How many hundreds of years? Well, not as long. They're actually, uh, this is the third, I think it's the third church on this site. The others were smaller and they built up from it. But it was almost all done during Justinian's reign. So it was done over like 50 or 60 years. Uh, and, and the story is that when they finally finished it and Justinian walked in, he looked up, he said, Solomon, I have outdone you. <laughs> because Solomon, of course, built the temple in Jerusalem. So without scaffolds. Yeah, without scaffolds. Yeah, that's wow. true. Um, okay, so you get the idea. And if you want to look at other pictures of this and some other Christian sites in Asia Minor or whatever, I can give you a Dropbox address or a box.com address that you can look at that stuff. All right, cathedrals, and I will find out the exact cathedral. I'm, I should know that, and I don't. Sorry. Uh, from the Byzantine period, we get in the West, and the Byzantine was mostly in the East because of the Greek-based design. You get the cathedral design starting with the Romanesque, and this starts about the 8th century. The Romanesque, you can see that it has some similarities in terms of domes and half-domes, but they started doing much more with spires. 
Okay, the spire was not a part of the Byzantine architecture. They just did the domes. And so you start getting still thick walls, stout columns, small windows, semicircular arches, that sort of thing. But you will not notice the design has changed. Does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. yeah. You turn it over? Mm -hmm. They started building the churches in the shape of a cross. And there are several reasons for that. One is the, the symbolic reason. And usually the churches would be built so that the, the, the worshipers were facing to the east where the sun rose. The idea being that that was symbolic of the coming of, the, of Jesus Christ as the son of the light into the world. Um, they would have, again, an altar and sanctuary here with a cur usually a curved apse, uh, something like that. Then they would have transepts, they're called, which are like the, the arms of the cross. Usually they would have separate chapels. If you've ever been in any of the Catholic churches, they will have transepts that go off, and they'll have separate chapels, smaller altars, <coughs> uh, so that they can have smaller services. The main nave, where everybody gathered, and then they would have at least one, sometimes more, aisles along the side, you know, outside a line of columns, so that you could move around. And then they would have a narthex, or what sometimes was called an atrium, out front, where people would gather and coming in and out. Okay? There are aspects of that that we still talk about, you know, the narthex in churches today. Um, so we, even Protestant churches, will use some of, that, some of that same terminology. So you had, and during the Romanesque time, pre-Romanesque and Romanesque time, is where you begin to get this idea, not only that churches are symbolic because they're in the shape of a cross, but also symbolic because as they started to grow taller, and it was during this period of time that they invented um, flying buttresses and external arches. You know what a flying buttress is? If I've got a wall like this, then that wall you know, has to be thick enough that it's not going to bend or fall. But if I want a thin wall, especially a wall that has a lot of windows in it so I can let a lot of light in, the way to do that, they discovered, is you put something outside and attach it to the wall and attach it to the ground, and that holds it in place. Then the wall is not dependent upon only its own strength to stand up. It's being held up by this outside piece, which is called a flying buttress. If you look at Notre Dame or any of the great cathedrals, you'll see these structures that come out, you know, like brackets on the outside of the building. Well, those are flying buttresses, and they are, they're intended so that the walls could be taller without falling over, and so that they could put windows in them. So the idea was, churches, instead of being these squat things, you know, and even as big as it is, as tall as it is, you look at it on the outside, and Hagia Sophia still looks kind of squat. All of a sudden, they're reaching to the heavens, okay? And they're full of light. These symbols of this, this vertical reaching to the sky, toward the heavens, the, all of the light coming in. That started even in this time period in terms of some of the height. But then the ultimate expression of that um, was, is the Gothic in the 12th to 15th centuries. Now, some of this was being developed earlier. Have you all read Pillars of the Earth? Yeah. The book Pillars of the Earth is all about the development of the, of the cathedrals and how it is they went from being these really heavy, it's a wonderful book, um, kind of uh, suggestive sometimes. I mean, it's, it's real people doing real things that real people do uh, in ancient times. So, but Pillars of the Earth, Ken Follett, um, and I recommend it because it deals a lot with this movement away from these huge stone block built churches to these buildings that look more like this. The verticals. Now, this is the, the high gothic. This is Notre Dame. The big window. This is the famous uh, rose window. Uh, all of this vertical stuff. I think that might be um, Cologne, the Cathedral of Cologne, which is extraordinary. And lots of, you know, in between all of these. Oh, these are flying buttresses. Okay, these things that stick out here, they connect right there, and then they come out. And they have them all along in between the windows. But in between there are the windows that let all this light in. Now, while they were figuring all this out, and the challenge was always who can build the fanciest, the tallest, the most light-filled cathedral, a lot of them fell down. In fact, in one of the books, I don't remember if it's this one or another text that I'm using, they said that if you're ever in Europe and you're looking at these extraordinary cathedrals with the, you know, the question you should always ask your tour guide is, when did the tower fall? 
because in almost every case they would have at some time something would came in because they were they were stretching the limits of the material and of their abilities. But a lot of it was seen. Well, some of it was, to be quite honest, was seen as a as bragging rights. You know, we've got the biggest cathedral, the tallest, the most light, the biggest windows, the whatever. Um, but but for many people, it really was an act of devotion. You know, to make a glorious, a spectacular edifice for God. And I had an experience um, after college. I went to Israel. I had some friends that were in Israel. And I went over there for a while, a um, couple months. And I was staying, as I traveled around on my own, I was staying in uh, hostel, youth hostels. I moved into one youth hostel and was taking the stuff out of my out of my backpack and I had a Bible. And I laid it down there, and the guy in the bunk next to me said, Oh, you got a Bible, you're a Christian? And I said, Well, yeah, I am. He said, Well, let's go talk about that. <laughs> he was Jewish. And uh, uh, from the from the States. When he graduated from college, we were about the same age, uh, he's a little bit older than me, he, his parents had sent him the grand tour of Europe, you know, which used to be, and his parents were very well to do, he did the grand tour of Europe, and then Israel. And so we bumped into each other, because he didn't like staying in fancy hotels, even though he could afford it if he could be around real people. So we're talking about this, and he'd just been in Europe, and he had visited all of these places. And he'd go, man, I saw these extraordinary things. And he said, I, I walk in and I go, whoa, and as a Jew, he said, I look at this and I go, and to think, it's all a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, being young and ignorant, I said, well, you know, uh, my God is much more in the beauty of natural creation and then all these edifices, uh, dummy. <laughs> and he went, oh no. He said, if there's anything that could cause me to believe that your Jesus was real, it's to walk around the corner of some place that was built in the 1400s and realize some stonemason spent his whole life doing this as an act of devotion. Wow. He was a much smarter Christian apologist than I was. Okay. And some of that was very true. That's why the cathedrals were built in many cases. In some cases, it was just bright lights. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. Why? What, what prompted the, the, the beginning of steeples? The idea of reaching to the heavens. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, well, for one thing, it could be seen from everywhere. You know, you could always find the church. Churches were almost right in the middle of town. That's true now. Yeah. You can go into a Mexican village. You know, look for the, the church tower, and you'll know you're going to find the middle of town if you, if you need to find your way around. So the, the high steeple was both uh, a landmark. It also was the very fact that they would do something that extraordinary, and beginning back in the 500s, uh, you know, when they started building tall buildings, the very fact that they, they would and could do something like that in itself was a testimony to the glory of God. They talked about it, so. Yeah, right. In, in Morelia, nothing can be built within the city, it's a city ordinance, taller than the cathedral. Yep. Yeah, people has to be taller. And I'm sure they probably have rules like that in Europe, too, at you one know, time. I've been very privileged to see many of these cathedrals. The one in Barcelona is... The Sagrada a, Familia? It is. You know, it's it true. brings you to your knees. It is exceptionally extraordinary. It is. I absolutely agree. I could bring you pictures of that, too. Um, the, the Hagia Sophia built in the 500s and the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which is not going to be finished until next decade, they think maybe, maybe. 2020. Um, maybe. And it is, it's just, your mouth drops open, you know, and you want to just fall to your knees when you go in that building. It is unbelievable, and it's still being built. Um, but if you ever have a chance to go to Barcelona, you, it's worth going just to visit the Sagrada Familia. Yes. How long have they been working on it? Since the 1880s. Um, because Gaudi, you know, you know the word Gaudi? Gaudi. Yeah. Well, Gaudi is the artist, the designer, and they're still working from his plans. He was killed by, he was hit by a trolley car in Barcelona in the 20s, I think it was. Um, and they've still been building it since then. In fact, when he was still alive, somebody asked him, how long is this going to take? <laughs> And he smiled and said, my employer is not in a hurry, meaning God, okay? And when you see what's there, you understand why it's taken them a hundred and some years already and more to go, because uh, it is 
Can't even describe it. Yeah. I have some books if you want to come and visit. You know, we've got coffee table books you can look at. But. So the, the cathedrals really represented uh, the development of the faith. Once it was legal, they moved toward this being a sign and symbol of the glory of God and of the worship of God. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about the Crusades from the, from the sublime to the not so. <laughs> now, although I'm going to surprise you um, in that uh, how my perception of the Crusades. The Crusades lasted for um, about 200 years. The first Crusade was launched or announced in 1095, so the 11th century. It was a series over 200 years where Western Christian Europe responded to pleas from the Eastern Emperor in Constantinople for help against the Muslims. They decided to go to war against Islam to free the Holy Land from Muslim control. Now here's where I'm going to surprise you. I believe strongly the Crusades were a war of defense, not offense. That does not mean all of the Crusades, and there were, um, there were seven main Crusades, but there were probably 13 or 14 total ones. Um, the, and, I, and I'm going to prove that to you in just a second. Um, there were atrocities committed by the Crusaders, and there were atrocities committed by the Muslims. Um, the, one of the reasons why the Crusades were announced is because there were atrocities. There were pilgrims being killed who wanted to visit the Holy Land. Prior to the 11th century, Christians made regular pilgrimages to the Holy Land, to Israel, uh, the birthplace of Jesus, and they were allowed. And then all of a sudden, there was a new uh, caliph in Egypt who started attacking these people. Now, let me show you in visual terms why I believe for all of, and, and I'm not defending the Crusades as being right, I'm just talking about why they happened. Um, for all of the atrocities, for all of the awfulness, for the fact that there were people of mixed motivation, the initial reason why the Crusades happened, I believe, is explained with two maps. This is a map of Christianity in AD 565. Now, this is before the advent of Islam. Now, you will notice the dark areas are where Christianity was present. And again, none of this had been done in, by the late 500s or early 600s. None of this was by force of arms. This was by missionary efforts. So all of the Middle East, all of North Africa, all of the uh, Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, most of Western Europe, all of Italy, all of Greece and the areas north of that, all of Asia Minor, well up into, you know, you get into Georgia, Armenia, some of the Russian areas. Now this is... Uh, there was actually a Celtic church up there. The, the dark green line is the Roman Empire, but all of these colored areas reflect a presence of Christianity. This was in the late 500s. Now, fast forward to 1154. Islam comes around in the 700s. 1154, this is what the world looks like. The dark green is Roman Catholicism. It's Western Christianity. This sort of uh, military green is the Orthodox Christianity. All of this from here down, all of the Holy Land, all of Egypt, all of North Africa, almost all of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, is Muslim. Very shortly after this, the Muslims took over all of Asia Minor and were banging on the gates of Constantinople. Today, those places are still Islamic. But, at one point, they had gotten all the way up to here, all the way up into France. That's where Charles Martel pushed them back, okay, in the 700s. So, for, from the 700s until the 11th century, Christian Europe saw Islam invading Europe on both sides, in, or coming at them from both sides. They had already taken over. It used to be that North Africa was one of the most important parts of Christianity. Augustine of Hippo was from right here. Okay, um, Syria, Antioch, the first Gentile church. And then later, you know, here, Ephesus and the seven churches of uh, Revelation. Again, shortly after this, they conquered all of that, too, and it's still Islamic. Christian Europe was looking at this and saying, guys, if we don't do something, they're going to keep coming up this way, and they're going to keep coming up this way, and they're doing it with armies, not with missionaries. 
They're doing it with armies. And I believe these, you know, this simple geographical fact demonstrates that you can't blame for whatever came later, whatever awfulnesses came later on both sides, by the way. Um, I, I think it was simply a matter that Western, Christian Western Europe said, if we don't do something, we're not going to be here. Yes? Yeah, I'm not clear as to why the Muslims were just taking over so much of Christianity. I, I'm not sure what was the... What was their motivation? Yeah. Well, can I, can I answer that? Mohammed said, <laughs> in, and said in the Quran, that they have an obligation to forcibly evangelize. Yeah. Yes. It's called holy war. Well... Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what they're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. Actually, actually, jihad, this wasn't jihad. Jihad is a war of retribution more. Yes. Okay. But they, what brought this on was the, the militant evangelistic fervor of Islam, which Muhammad had written in the Quran, that they had an obligation to convert the infidels, and if the infidels would not convert voluntarily, then they would do so by the sword. That was part of their faith. You know, part of our faith, is that we are we're supposed to, you know, to teach and preach and share the gospel and hopefully bring people to the faith and baptize them. But ours doesn't say, and if they won't listen to you, then make them. And Islam does. Okay? Now, does that make sense to you in terms of where? Now, this is in 1054. The first crusade was announced in 1095. So this is the picture right before that happens. I'm not saying the Crusades were a good idea. I'm just saying that if I had been Pope Urban II, or if I had been one of the military leaders, in, a Christian military leader in Western Europe, and I had looked at this map, I would have gone, well, we darn sure better do something. So looking at this map, where did the first Crusade go? Okay, I'll show, I'll get the Crusade in just a second. Oh, you know, okay. I've got a specific map that will show you the Crusades. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, one, one question. The Quran still states this. Yes, Is that the Quran still in what we can say today? would be the intent of the Muslim faith, that they still intend to conquer by force, if not voluntarily? Yes. Uh, now, there are uh, other people will quote other verses of the Quran about being compassionate and understanding, and, and it does say that too. Um, but the, the, the whole justification that, that the Islamists, when you have the ist at the end, those are the radical ones. Mm -hmm. You know, the al Qaeda's, etc., the radical Islamists, those who are in radically Islamic countries, who hold to you know to the idea of jihad and some of the other uh, the Sharia law, you know Iraq and Iran and places like that. Although they're different, they're two different different lines of the Islamic faith. One is Sunni, one is Shia. Uh, those are the two big schools. Still, they look at the Quran and say that anybody who is disobedient to to um, the teachings of Muhammad, that's why. The very fact that you would um, you would write a book like the Satanic Verses, uh, Solomon Rushdie's book, where he suggested that that uh, Muhammad was less than righteous in his writing, they put out a death warrant on it. They gave permission to any true Muslim who found Solomon Rushdie to kill him and be free of prosecution because of that. That's still that mentality, you know. That that and it's a very you know, it's still very present. It is still in the Quran. And there are some people who focus on that verse and some people who focus on the others. Most Muslims are as peace-loving as any as anybody, as we are. But there is in their document justification for that, if, if that's what they want to focus on. Okay? All right, so this, I believe, is what the real cause was. Now, let me give you some history, and we'll look at a couple of other maps. Oh, we got 12 minutes. Um, in 1009, the Caliph of Egypt calls for the destruction of Christian shrines, and that included the attack on Christian pilgrims. In 1021, the uh, there is a Byzantine that is an Eastern Christian protectorate of shrines. In other words, they commit themselves to try to protect them, and they provide military support for that. I mean, they send troops to protect Christian shrines in the Holy Land. But then in 1071, the Seljuk Turks, this is where the name Turkey comes from, um, they are originally from the area we now know as Turkmenistan, okay, which is uh, one of the, part of the former Soviet Union. The Seljuk Turks defeat the Byzantine army at Manzikirk. And so the, the Byzantine army has been weakened. In 1095, the Byzantine Emperor Alexius I Comnensis begs for Western help against the Seljuk Turks. This is the point at which they're banging on the door. You know, the, the other map I showed you was 1054. Most of Asia Minor was still green. 
By 1095, they literally were outside the walls of Constantinople. Unfortunately, Constantinople had very significant walls that held, held them at bay for a long time. Um, and then later on, Western Christian crusaders helped weaken them so that they ended up being defeated. <laughs> so that same year, after being asked to help, Pope Urban II, now remember, these were time periods when frequently there wasn't a political leader that had authority or power, and so the Pope calls for a military response. Pope Urban calls for holy war, and he says that the response of Christians uh, in Europe to this threat of Islam, that um, the, the, the slogan line, the cry of the First Crusade was Deus Vult, which is Latin for God wills it. Okay. Immediately, you get a bunch of people who sort of just jump on their horse and ride off in all directions at once, and they take off toward the Holy Land. It's called the Peasants' Crusade, and they're immediately massacred because there's no leaders, there's no organization, they're not military people. The idea was, the Pope said, anyone who does this will be blessed and everything else. Well, a lot of people had no business going to war anywhere, or even talking sharp to somebody else, <laughs> to go off and try to start a war, the Peasants' Crusade, and they had no stand a chance. Then in 1099, the First Crusade, which is predominantly French and Italian um, leaders, they were knights and rulers, um, you know, significant people, they leave from Europe, cross over, meet up in uh, Istanbul, what was you know, then Byzantium, and enter the Holy Land and take Jerusalem. This is what that path looked like. A number of the major leaders that you have, uh, Raymond of Toulouse starts out here in France. The red line is his, he and his army. Uh, Robert of Flanders from up here at Bruges, he comes down to Lyon and goes down into Italy, crosses over, to Greece and meets up in Constantinople. Godfrey of Bouillon uh, starts up here, takes a different route to Constantinople. Uh, Bohemond from southern Italy, from here, uh, Terratino is from. They meet here, they go over to the county of Edessa, they conquer Odessa, first they conquer Nicaea, which by this time had been controlled by the Turks. Uh, remember the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Council? Then to Odessa, then Antioch, and then down to Jerusalem. In 1099, they conquer Jerusalem and pretty much are in control of the whole Holy Land. They create a number of crusader states. The first one they create, this area up here around the city of Odessa, is called the County of Odessa, the Principality of Antioch. They have the County of Tripoli, and then the large one, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And over each of these, and you'll notice that the squares here are major um, crusader castles. You can still visit some of these. For instance, in Acre, there's a large castle that's still there that is a crusader castle. Uh, you also have crusader castles on Cyprus and other places. If you go on that cruise that I'm going to be speaking on in October, we're going to visit some of the places. But they take over this area and they set up Latin Western Christian kingdoms in, the, in those places. Um, and in doing so, and they feel like they're retaking the Holy Land that Jesus came from, and they have a right to do this. In the process, there were atrocities in both directions. When the Crusaders took Jerusalem, they killed pretty much everybody in there. Well, a couple of years later, when the, when the Islamic troops took Acre, another major city at that time, they killed everybody in there. And it went back and forth. It wasn't until later on, under Richard the Lionheart of England and Saladin, the great Islamic leader, the two of them respected each other, and at one point they even had a truce. They would not commit atrocities. You know, they fought a war, but they fought a war honorably. As much as you can fight a war honorably. Uh, you didn't have all of that. Now, this is what most people think the Crusaders look like, all right? These giant chargers and armor and the whole thing. The fact is, most of the people who went on the Crusades ended up far poorer than when they started. In fact, they left their property, they left their families. In many cases, their property sort of fell into ruin or got taken over by other people. They lost most of what they had when they left. There were very few people that profited. A few, a few, some of those who did profit were the military orders, like the Knights Templar you've heard of, the Knights Hospitaller or the Knights of St. John, and the Knights Teutonic. Three military monastic orders. They took, they took um, orders as monks but their response wasn't, you know, their job as monks wasn't prayer and service and, you know, whatever. It was to be a military arm for the church. 
they got very wealthy. In fact, the, the Knights Templar, one of the reasons they ended up being extinguished much later, which is a different story, is because they got so wealthy and so powerful as an order, even though personally, individually, they had all taken a vow of poverty, people kept giving them things. You know, they kept thinking they would find grace with God if they gave to this religious order, and the Knights Templar became very, very, very wealthy. They were sort of the bankers of Europe at one point. Uh, this is what we think the Crusaders were like. Historians, many historians say that it's more likely this is what they look like. <laughs> they were bedraggled and beaten. They were worn out by war. Um, they had little to go back to, some of them, when they were done. Uh, they didn't get rich along the way. This opinion that a lot of people have that the Crusades were a bunch of sort of hyped up, you know, oversexed frat boys who decided to go to the Holy Land and kick some Islamic butt, that simply isn't accurate. You know, that's not that's not how it was. Um, it wasn't the first crusade, the most successful? It was. I mean, it was the first crusade that ended up uh, creating those states. Um, all of this was a result of the first the first full crusade. The Peasants' Crusade uh, started out, and it was a horrible disaster, but it wasn't an official crusade. It was just a bunch of people who thought they, you know, thought they would try this. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot more time to talk about this, but let me... What's that? Like the pigs in the So, 1144, the oldest of the Crusader states, Edessa, falls. Now, in, in this time, the, between the 1090s and 1144, there's about 150 years there, the Islamic world gets their act together. And they end up working together. They get rid of some of the maniacs, like the Caliph of Egypt, that caused the problem in the first place, or at least who finally set fire to the problem, um, was deposed. And so they ended up with a much more sensible approach. They organized themselves. Their armies were united. They had leaders like Saladin, eventually, who was a brilliant military leader. And so they take back Edessa. Um, in, because Edessa was taken back, they then launch a second crusade from the west in 1146. It's disastrously defeated. Um, then in 1187, the Third Crusade is prompted by the Islamic armies taking Jerusalem back, which was, that was the heart of the whole thing. You know, the holy city was where the, kind of the whole focal point. The Third Crusade is led by Richard I, who's known as Richard the Lionheart from England. You've probably heard of him. The Emperor Frederick Barbarossa from Germany and King Philip Augustus II of France. Three kings, English king, French king, German king, join forces. They uh, take the Third Crusade. They're quite successful. Unfortunately, uh, Frederick Barbarossa drowns in a river uh, on the way there. There are some disputes. Uh, Barbarossa and Philip Augustus had been arguing with each other. It ends up with pretty much Richard the Lionheart leading the thing. Because uh, you know kings don't like to listen to other people's ideas, apparently. Um, so, then in 1204, we have one of the, the um, a horrible thing, the Fourth Crusade, a bunch of crusaders get together, and they're promised that um, they'll, their passage will be paid by, by sea, and they go to Venice. Well, the Venetians were always hard businessmen, and they said, okay, well, we're, we're not going to let you do this. You don't have enough money to pay us unless you go and you take the city that we would like to own, because it was the kingdom of Venice at that point. So the, the Crusaders conquer a city for Venice. And then Venice says, well, you know, that's really not enough. We'll take you to Constantinople. But we want the city of Constantinople. And the Crusaders agree. So the Venetian ships take the Crusaders to Constantinople. And the emperor of the, of the Eastern Roman Empire says, come on in, guys. Well, they sack the city and take it away from him. And for a period of several years, there is the Latin kingdom, or Western kingdom, of Constantinople. And they turn the Hagia Sophia, for instance, they turn it into a Latin church. They change the decorations, do different services, all sorts of things. That happens for a little while until they finally get tired and leave. Um, then we have the, the most horrific thing. In 1212, the word had gotten out that... The people, to be really successful in these crusades, you have to be innocent and pure. Well, who's more innocent and pure than children? So they literally gather a bunch of children who start across Europe, and along the way, they either die because of the, just the trip, or they are killed. Most of them end up being taken into slavery. You know, it's a horrific 
kind of event. That's not a fit, that was not sanctioned by anybody, but it was like this, this crusader fervor existed during this time. You gotta do something. And then when they would have a victory, everybody would get very excited about it, you know, let's do this, more of this. Or when they had a beat, they'd say, we can't take this, we gotta do something to fight back. So no matter what happened, they continued to have for 200 years this sort of enthusiasm. Well, they had the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Crusades and accomplished nothing. We then had weird stuff, and one of the other things that's horrific about this is some of the Crusaders, as they traveled across Europe, they decided, well, you know, these, the Muslims are not the only infidels, non-Christians, there's also Jews. So in a number of the cities across Europe and in, into Asia where there were Jewish populations, the Crusaders attacked them. Again, I'm not defending the Crusaders, don't misunderstand me. I understand why it happened, but once it got started, there were horrific things that happened on both sides. Um, there was 1155 to 1249, there was a crusade from Sweden to Finland. <laughs> um, there were a lot of, more than just the official crusades. And then in 1212, the 10th crusade is the Reconquista. That was where the armies of Western Europe joined together to force the Muslims out of Spain. So this is on the other side. This is trying to regain Western Europe, to push the Muslims out of Western Europe, out of, uh, particularly at that point, out of Spain and Portugal. When they pushed them out, the Arabic peoples, what they left behind was a treasure trove for Western Christians. The, the Arabic peoples at that time were far more sophisticated in science and mathematics, astronomy, and any number of other things. In fact, one of the things that Western Europe got from the from, it sounds funny to say almost, from the Islamic control of, um, of Grenada and of the areas in Spain. They, they took over the libraries that the Muslims left behind and they're studying these books of mathematics. And for instance, they rediscovered some of the writings of, of Aristotle had been lost in the West. Remember the Dark Ages, libraries had gone away. Well, the Arabs, Arabic peoples had kept all this. They discovered zero. Now, you go, what? Big deal. Think what it would be like to try to do common arithmetic without zero. The West didn't have zero. They used Roman numerals. Write down seven Roman numerals and try to add them up. <laughs> you can't do it. It's not, it's not laid out in a way that makes sense. And there is no zero in Roman numerals. The idea of a placeholder to, to, to indicate nothing or a space. This was a revolution. I can remember as a little kid watching a, one of these Saturday morning, you know, you were there kind of things, and having this monk try to explain to this other guy from using the libraries from Grenada. Uh, well, okay, and it's a, it's, this is a, it's called a zero. And the guy says, well, what is it? And he goes, well, it's nothing. He goes, what do you mean it's nothing? Well, it means nothing. Well, then why do we need it? Well, well, you know, there was no concept of that kind of thing. Um, then in 1291, the last crusaders are driven from the Middle East. I'm going to go about three more minutes. I'm sorry to keep you guys on. Um, if you need to sleep, go ahead. <laughs> Reasons for the crusade. First of all, it was a response to the Byzantine emperor's request for help. Okay, the emperor in Constantinople, what we know as Constantinople, said help. And the pope felt like... Now, they always saw Constantinople as the powerful place. They had the armies. They had the, the empire had never fallen there, and now they need our help. Secondly, to defend Christian Europe against further, further Muslim invasion, recognizing they were, they were coming out of in both directions. All right? There was the hope of reuniting the two halves of Christendom. You had the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Next week, I'm going to start out talking about the Great Schism briefly, the separation between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And there was the hope by some that by joining together in this great quest and by helping the people in Constantinople that they would bring the two halves of the church back together. Um, it's a fact that Pope Urban II thought it would establish his authority more clearly as the leader of the Western world. And so that's why he you know, called for it, mandated it. There was a sense in which there was a defense of Christian holy sites and pilgrims, a very real need. There was the idea of needing to focus energy of Western knights away from internal fighting. You had all these medieval knights. And anybody who knows anything about military knows that one of the worst things that can happen to an army is to have nothing to do. You train these people how to fight, you tell them they're warriors, and then you have them sit around. 
you got to have them do something. That's why I think I said before, every military installation will have all of the rocks on the base will be painted white. Okay? I just got to have them do something. You know, peel all those potatoes. You know, why? Because you need to do something. Somebody said, if it moves, salute it. If it, if it doesn't move, paint it. Okay? <laughs> well, they had that problem with the Western, the, the Knights. We, we have, there's no battles for them in Europe anymore. We've got to do something. And this is, a, this is a worthwhile cause. And then there was, a, theologically, a sense and the belief of the imminent second coming of Jesus. Everybody thought Jesus was going to come in 1,000. Okay? Everybody thought he was going to come right away, like next Tuesday. But they thought for sure he'll come at 1,000. You know, a nice round number like that. It's like when you hit... You know, uh, you, when your car rolls over, yeah, you know, what's that? We went through all that for 2,000. 2,000, yeah. exactly. And it was even bigger in 1,000. And But they thought that Jesus was going to come back right away and that it was important that the Holy Land, the place where Jesus had lived and walked, where he had been born, where he had died, and from which he had been resurrected and ascended, that it was important that Christians have control of that. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that's how they thought. Now, what were the consequences of the Crusades? First... It did stop the advance of Islam. Islam never came into Eastern Europe. Well, it has come into Eastern Europe, but not in a military sort of sweeping kind of way like it had before. Um, it was pushed out of Western Europe. It still does exist, like a number of religions exist because of missionary efforts, but not the openness to military advances that they had before. Unfortunately, contrary to what they hoped for, it ended up being the final split between Eastern and Western Christianity. When the Western Crusaders took over Constantinople, forget any further positive relationships. And in fact, it was almost certainly the weakening of Constantinople because of that kind of thing that meant that Constantinople eventually was conquered by the assaults of the Celtic Turks. The city might have held out a lot longer if it hadn't been weakened by other Christians having fought there. There was, and importantly, a reestablishing of trade between East and West, including developments in learning and culture. Like I mentioned, a lot of ancient writings that have been lost to the West were rediscovered. They ended up trading. You know, it used to be that spices simply weren't available in Europe. You all know about how, you know, until recently, uh, what it was like to eat food in England. Okay. <laughs> Everything was heavy. It was meat, potatoes, starch, right? Well. That was as good as it got in Europe. But by this, the crossing over of cultures, the Western Europeans were introduced to spices and to other styles of cooking. And traffic routes to the Far East started being developed because of that. And so there was very much an expansion in learning and culture and trade. There was a focus and clarification of the European culture. You know, the Western Europeans began to think about, um, you know, not just my own little provincial kind of control, but they started when they started joining together in armies, you notice from Flanders, from France, from Germany, from Italy, they got together. Well, they began to continue, they began to develop even more of a sense of a European culture. Um, there was the launch of a Western spirit of exploration. It was a big deal for all of these people to go all the way to the Holy Land. Well, once they had done that, you know, it was, then they were interested in seeing other places too. You know, well, I wonder what North Africa's like. Uh, I wonder what blah, blah. And so this idea of exploration came out of the Crusades. There was a clarification of papal authority. Whether Urban II got all of the credit he wanted or not, there was a sense in which the Pope was recognized as having the authority to call upon the powers of the Western world. And then, unfortunately, long-term enmity between Christianity and Islam that we've never gotten over. They still talk about. I mean, one of our presidents not too many years ago said something about, yeah, it's a great crusade. Well, everybody in the Islamic world was offended because the very word crusade means some, you know, it's made with so much baggage since this time. Um, and so that, we've never, we've never resolved some of those rifts. And that's not all Christianity's fault. Again, we did some horrific things. They did some horrific things. And the fact is that what caused the problem was the fact that they were using military force to conquer and, and forcibly convert people to their faith. And at some point, they should have expected a reaction to that. I'm not sure that we gave them the right one, but it's not unreasonable to believe that a reaction was coming. And that was the Crusades. Does that make sense? Yeah.